dealers think about when they wake up is, I got to get something done today, okay? So you got to apply yourself and get something done. So every day I want to apply something, get something done or something moving that's not moving. A new FTC rule is threatening dealerships nationwide, but this former NADA chairman believes he can stop it. Today I'm speaking with Jeffrey Pohanka, chairman of Pohanka Automotive Group. We discuss the 38 billion potential cost of the FTC's cars rule, breaking down Tesla's direct to consumer model, when will Chinese cars come to America? And much more. Don't forget to click subscribe so you never miss an episode. What's up, everyone? This is Car Dealership Guy. You're listening to the Car Dealership Guy podcast, which is my effort to give you access to the most transparent insights into the car market. But before we get into the show, this episode is brought to you by the Auto Hauler Exchange. Auto Hauler Exchange is changing how people who send and carry cars work together. Now, if you need to send a car, you can directly work with carriers all over the country. And if you carry cars, you don't have to look through brokers' lists to find good, fair jobs anymore. By eliminating the middleman, all shipments on the auto hauler exchange come directly from the owner of the vehicle being shipped, with carriers receiving real shipment opportunities at direct pricing. Auto hauler exchange helps shippers and carriers work together easily and clearly, adding transparency and making better partnerships. Get off the auto hauling roller coaster by getting on the auto hauler exchange. To learn more, visit autohaulerexchange.com or click the link in the show notes below. This episode is also brought to you by CDK Global. CDK Global has been empowering nearly 15,000 dealers with the tools and technology they need to build deeper relationships with customers. Their team is keenly aware of the state of dealership technology. And while many vendors promise seamless experiences between your CRM, DMS, digital retail, and fixed ops, most of these bolt-on solutions tend to break workflows and cause more harm than good. That is why CDK has launched a new dealership experience platform. This new integrated software consists of everything you need to operate a dealership efficiently while delivering an unparalleled experience to your customers. Basically, everything working together, not separate, one system to run your dealership as opposed to 10. CDK developed it with an outside-in approach, listening to dealers every step of the way. You can learn more about CDK's dealership experience platform by visiting cdkglobal.com slash DXP or clicking the link in the show notes below. How's life as you're transitioning out of the, being the NADA chairman? What's life like nowadays? A little less travel, but I'm still very connected. I got pulled back in a week ago on some big issues. So I'm here in D.C. I live nine miles from the building, and uh, uh, so I, I will stay connected for a long time. It's not like I'm from Arkansas. No slide on Arkansas. I'm not going back to Arkansas. You know, it'd probably be different if I live far away from Washington, but I'm still here. I love it. Jeff, I want to start with your background, right? You are a third generation dealer. Uh, Pohanka, you know, it's uh, just a n- n- notorious dealing group to say the least. I've, I've, I mentioned to you on our last call, I've actually bought cars from you in the past. So very, very familiar, even though, even though I'm not from the DC area. Take us back to kind of your, your, er, your early beginnings in this industry and getting into the car business through the family. Well, it's a great story. My, my grandfather, Frank Pohanka, uh, lived in the Bronx and he was a late grower. He ran away from home in eighth grade, wanted to become a jockey. Got a job in a horse farm with Stable Boy in Long Island, a famous horse farm, and was able to become a jockey and was very successful, raced all over North America, made a lot of money. Eventually, he couldn't keep weight. He got through the job. So he decided what to do the rest of his life, and he was good with his hands. So I've become an auto mechanic. So I went back to New York, went to the New York Public Library, read all the books that there were on cars, which there probably weren't that many. He worked in different garages to learn different technologies. And he got hired by General Motors as a service rep. And they moved him to Washington, D.C. as a service manager of factory-owned dealership and became his own Chevrolet dealer in 1919 in downtown Washington. So uh, now my father started working for my grandfather at the age of 13, like I did, you know, summers. And then, uh, you know, I got into business uh, and after college and there was no pressure to go in the business. I have an older brother who's now deceased and a younger sister. He was a, mil- a historian, a writer. She's a scientist. They had no interest in the business. And that's fine because my father's brother, older brother, they were partners in, in the dealership. And now here's interesting. My grandfather ran away from him in eighth grade, but yet his two children, my father and my uncle, went to Princeton and MIT. So it tells you something. And... My father's more the salesman and his brother's more the engineer. 
So he wasn't really suited, the engineer for the car business. My father bought him out and he ended up working on nuclear submarines, which was what he was good at. So there was no pressure on me to enter in the business. And uh, my plan was to, you know, I work summers, but it's different working summers and working full time. I was going to go to business school and figure out what to do the rest of my life. And my dad goes, why don't you work in the dealership full time, a year in sale service, a year in sales, and then go to business school, you know, really learn some business experience versus being a car jockey or whatever I was doing. Okay. That probably makes sense. I went to night school. It's hard to work 12 hours a day and then go to night school. <laughs> I tried for a while and I just I stayed in the business. You know, I think I learned probably more from hands-on business than from a uh, hypothetical and from a uh, school, you know, it's, I call it the infamous stepping stone that turns permanent. Everyone, everyone says, yeah, it's the stepping stone and no one ever leaves. That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I was, um, when I did my undergrad, I was really involved in the marketing aspect of our dealership. And so I was, you know, uploading pictures to the website and having all that fun. But I, I, I know the feeling of, you know, balancing the two and to your point, right? Like I remember people were like, this is now I'm talking about college time. People are like, our friends were like, Hey, you should join this, you know, frat and whatnot. And at the time I said, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Like I would much rather be at the dealership now. It's just a much more productive use of my time. And, you know, I, th I think it worked out, but um, it's funny how, you know, that that lifestyle, it's especially with the dealership, you know, retail business, long hours. I mean, there's always something to do. Did you want to be a dealer, right? So I know you weren't, wasn't, you didn't have pressure, but did you want to be a dealer? Did you desire that? Well, look, there's a lot of pride because of the generations, you know, involved in the dealership. And uh, I knew there was no pressure to do it. I'm sure my dad would like me to have done it. And, uh, but it just kind of happened. Now there was a time where I was going to get out of business and I'll explain that. So we had Oldsmobile and we were one of the biggest Oldsmobile dealers in the country. And Oldsmobile's gone. It's gone for a reason. Quality control was not very good. And it put me in the service lane and I, no one trained me, you know, it's put me out there. I was a fourth writer and people, the other writers are pretty smart. They'd let the car go back to me that they didn't want to work on, you know, like a warranty job or something like that. And I had molasses technicians and it was, <laughs> and, and, you know, also we sold like 2000 diesel engines. They all blew up. You know, it's just, it, it, there was no like tech line like we have. There was no parts inventory like we have now, just in time. Didn't have all the tools. We had computer command control, a lot of the new emission things. The factory didn't know how to fix these things. Transmission issues. It was all happening all at once. And I had really no training. I figured, oh, he must know what's going on. And and then I went to sales. And yeah, I was okay salesperson, but I felt guilty selling these cars into the shop. Because we, we sold a lot of cars, but didn't have a good CSI. And that was really frustrating for me. It got to the point where I saw all the problems. Now we were making a lot of money. We had Honda too. We were making a lot of money. And 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 that was good, but it's not all about money. And I said, I, I can't handle this anymore. I'm gonna get out of the business. So my father goes, Do you have a month? I said, Yeah, I will give you a month. He goes, How about I send you to Michigan to uh General Motors Institute? They have a month long program for dealer sons, dealer daughters. And will you do that and then come back? I said, okay, sure. So this is like the early 80s. It's a recession, it's a really bad recession. I go to Michigan and the unemployment is 23%. And they're fishing in the Flint River for sustenance, night and day, not for sport. And half the town is abandoned, boarded up. It's really a horrible time. It's winter time, And I'm like, man, it's pretty bad here. Um, we're doing pretty good back home. I at least owed my dad to write a report when he needs to fix his business. So I wrote this detailed report, you know, you need an alignment machine. This person's a maybe problem. And, you know, I'm going to give it to him. And, 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 and how old were you at the time? I'm 23, maybe 24. And so I go back, give him this 10 page report and he goes, this is pretty good. Why, why don't I put you in charge? You implement these things. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go walk the talk. <laughs> Okay, so I'm in charge of two parts farmers, two service farmers, and a big body shop, and I fix the things that, uh, you know, that were a problem to me. So here I am, you know. 
you mentioned the Institute of GM, right? And you mentioned sons and daughters. Why is the car business, why has it remained a pretty local business? Yes, we have, you know, massive groups nowadays, but still for the most part, it seems like, you know, local groups really do excel in many ways. And I mean, there's still thousands across the country, whereas you look at, you know, any anything, any other type of retail, it's really moved online. What do you think that, what do you think has driven that, right? Why is the car business historically a very local kind of family business type type deal? Well, you know, I think, I think pride is somewhat growing up into it is another, we're very many businesses under one roof. You can never become an expert in all of them. So there's always something new, something new to learn, some new challenge. You know, where can it, where can you get a job like that? Where you're involved in so many different things from operations to marketing, to computer systems, to data, to real estate, to, you know, I mean, (laughs) There are many jobs like that that require so many different hats. And I think it may be, uh, you know, it's nice to have your kids working your dealership and they, they kind of get a, a, attracted to it. And obviously it's a you know, challenging business, but if you work hard, you can make a good buck, make a good living and make a real contribution to society. So where else are you going to get a job like that? And then you eventually become kind of your own boss. Yeah. So on that note, right, you, there, it, I agree with you that, again, so many different elements in, you know, auto retail, but let's talk only about Pohanka for a second. You're in a very crowded market, right? DC market. I mean, just naming a couple of names, Coons, Sheehy, Rosenthal, Mile One, Dark Cars, Horseman. I mean, there's, there's a lot of players there. What do you think you've done that has allowed your brand, your, your company to really excel and continue to grow through these years? Well, we have an excellent culture. It's been built up over lots of lots of years. I mean, there's three ingredients for success: a good product, good location, and good people. Okay, and obviously, culture is part of that. So, we've really worked hard uh, as we've expanded uh, methodically and smartly uh, to make sure those things were still those ingredients were there. You know, good location, good product, good people, and uh, I think that's been successful for us. And you know, I can't speak for other families. We do have a lot of car families in Washington. Washington is a affluent market generally. You know, some areas aren't as affluent as others. It's 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 an interesting market. It's a very competitive market. Uh, but I think it's been uh, been a good one for the people who've been here. Now, what's funny? Not funny. Back in the teens, where my grandfather worked, there was an Orsman and a Rosenthal working in the showroom. And became dealers a few years after my grandfather. So this is like the epicenter just exploded, you know. The Rosenthal's the, the, Pohan- the Pohanka Mafia. <laughs> and, uh, so this obviously there was this little group that expanded, you know, and uh, and yeah. we all get along with each other. It's, it's a good thing. Competition is friendly competition. We all get along with each other. We just want to kill each other and win. No, nah, I'm just kidding. We, we can friendly do, competition. Do and our managers, <laughs> you know, here's the, you know, that's. The real the problem is we really compete with ourselves. The, the problem is uh, multiple dealerships. Generally, the dealerships compete with themselves, each other. They should be competing. Uh, here's an example. It, it, we should be competing. Like our stores are competitive with each other. They should be competing with the, you know, don't beat up your, your sibling, beat up the neighborhood kid, you know, as, as a situation. But it's it's. It's been a good ride, and and we look forward to a lot more years, you know, of this. There, there'll be some challenges ahead of us coming, as you know, in the auto industry. Oh yeah, we'll we'll, we'll get a lot into uh, legislation, electrification. I have a lot of topics here that I want to discuss. This episode is brought to you by my very own car dealership guy, industry job board, cdgjobs.com. My industry job board, connecting the best talent in automotive with the best companies, will remain absolutely free for CDG listeners to post and fill available roles at their companies. This free job board is for anyone in automotive, vendors, dealers, lenders, manufacturers, auto tech, everyone. Already, over 100 companies have posted open positions, including Lithia Motors, Recurrent, Credit Acceptance, Vero's Credit, Cars Commerce, Shift Digital, Plug, Full Path, Westlake, Trade Pending. You get the point. The best part is that when these companies hire through cdgjobs.com, they are hiring the most informed candidates in the marketplace. So don't hesitate. You can add your open roles today by visiting cdgjobs.com or clicking the link in the show notes below. That's cdgjobs.com. Tell me a little bit about behind the scenes. Like, what does your role at Pohanka look like today? And specifically, I want to know how do you allocate your time? Like, what does a week or a day in your life look like nowadays? 
look, ours is a team effort. You know, I couldn't do all this myself. And we have a lot of long-term staff that now have ownership in the dealership. You know, I think in the past year and a half, two years, you know, I've taken on the NDA role, which is a, a bigger role, shepherding the industry. And it, it, it here's the background of NDA. You know, I'm the 2022 chairman. Is that my grandfather died when my dad was 29. You know, he was pretty much running the dealership. He wasn't really equipped to run the dealership. In fact, back then, Oldsmobile, we had Oldsmobile. They had a dealership three blocks away selling the same brand. Talk about competition. My dad at 29 was not really equipped to run the dealership. He didn't have quite all the experience he needed. But he found NEDA was located just down the street, like three blocks. At that time, NDA headquarters, three blocks. We were located on 20th Street, eight blocks in the White House. NDA is worse down the street. Discovered NDA, took classes, joined the third 20 group in the United States. And that really helped him to, to survive that period. So he wanted to get back, became a director, later president of NDA in 76. So I kind of grew up with NDA. We have a 50, 60 year relationship with them. So that's kind of the NDA connection, which is probably. Uh, what we talked about. What's my average day? Look, you got it. We got to sell cars and we got to service cars. Okay. And that's the root uh, of our business. And uh, if we don't do that, nothing else works. So, what's different between working, say, for your own business, a dealer, and say a public company? Okay. Or say outside the dealership, you're working for a big, big firm. A lot of those people work for a big firm. His name's not on the building. They figure, what am I going to do when I get off work today? What dealers think about when they wake up is, I got to get something done today. <laughs> okay. So you got to apply yourself and get something done. So every day I want to apply something, get something done or something moving that's not moving. And a lot of it's educating your people, you know, education. So giving them the tools to get the job done because I can't do it. It's like a coach. And I talked, I talked to managers said, Look at the football. The coach can't make the tackles. He can't go out and tackle. Sometimes they try <laughs> get in trouble. They can't. They got to teach people how to run the play. So you got to run the play. The problem with, you know, what's interesting, I read something, you know, in the United States, our, we do horrible and standardized testing. We're like 25th in science and math. It's horrible. But yeah, like something like 90% or 95% of the major discoveries come from America. The pharmaceutical medicines, you know, Google, Apple, you know, all the Microsoft, they're all American inventions. There aren't similar companies that look alike around the world. Now, why is that? Why are, why are we 25th in standardized test scores? Because we're entrepreneurialism. We're entrepreneurial. We, the next big discovery is somebody's garage, you know, and other countries are not. We don't have a caste system. You're not limited. You're limited by your ability. By your desire, by your knowledge, and the car is like that too, and uh, and so we got to get something done every day, you know, uh, and and that's what it takes. So, it, where do you apply yourself to do that? You know, we have a lot, again, we have a lot of 20, 30 year team members now have ownership in the dealerships. They earn their, their place under the sun, and it's basically called the ownership mentality. You know, you shouldn't. I think you got to spread the wealth and try to help people to grow and, and take responsibility like their their owners themselves. So I think we've been fairly successful at doing that. Of course, what binds us is the culture, you know. Uh, and I have other family members in the business and, and long term. Uh, I have a long term partner going back to really late seventies been with us. So uh, so it's a good good arrangement, successful for us, you know. Point six billion dollar company with sixteen hundred employees, but you know what? It's one car at a time. Take care of every customer and uh, try to get your people the training and the tools they need to get the job done. You mentioned one car at a time. You know, someone once told me, which I love this uh, line. They said, "Like averages are dangerous because when you look at an average in a retail business, right? You might have a you know a one percent." failure rate but that one percent is that's real people that's that's actual experiences and so it's you know we set like one of our core values in a car dealership guy which is you know focus down to the last basis point because to your point it's one car at a time 
and you know really focusing on every single customer every single opportunity you know you look at a whole holistic average someone's going to be disappointed so i think that's a it's a really important line let's go back to the mutation the problem is it's an advantage for america the problem is our staff will mutate every day away from proven steps that work you know so we all are trying to shortcut find a better way but they get off off track they don't run the play so a lot of it is continue to help them to see here's the benefit here's why you do it this way and it's it's hard to it's like herding cats sometimes that's the challenge of our business it gives us these great inventions and things uh but also causes people to be distracted and, and not run the play correctly and then that's i think the uh, frustration for me because you can teach them but you got to keep an eye on them, make sure they continue to do it like they should they right. yield the best results for them you know and the customer I want to pivot to the future of this industry, right? Legislation, because there's a lot of stuff happening right now. Uh, just the table set at a very high level, right? Most people listening to this already know that the FTC introduced this thing, uh, something called the CARS rule, which just stands for combating auto retail scams. Our new rule meant to, you know, set all types of new, uh, just changes to dealership processes, advertisements and whatnot. You, I'm sure you could you know, speak a lot more knowledgeably to this than I can. Before we even get into the, the crux of what this means for the industry and what's where, you know, where we're headed, why has the industry gone to this point? Why is the FTC you know, coming up with a rule that has the word scam in it with respect to you know, the, the, like, w- what is going on, right? Give us the lay of the land here. Well, you know, something I say is they think we're ripping people off. They just don't know how we're doing it, you know? Here's the, here's the problem with the car business. It's not a problem. You know, a lot of our sales are negotiated. And a lot of people, I don't want to pay more than the next person. And that causes people unease. What's a good deal? A good deal is a state of mind. You know, some people have the most dissatisfaction, got the best deal, because they don't know when they would be satisfied. So a lot of this drives, this negotiated process drives a lot of things. But look during COVID what's happened in, in COVID. We had greater trice, price transparency. We were willing to quote a price. We had much more confidence because of the shortages. Here's the car. We knew there were fewer cars available than demand. And the consumer, you know, used car prices went up more than new cars, 40%. And consumer satisfaction was very good in that period. So was dealer profitability. The deal was probably better for the consumer during COVID than before COVID. Because if they had a trade, it was so much higher in value. And so that tr- price transparency uh, was a good thing. But now we get with more supply, you know, a lot of people are saying, if I can give you this deal, I mean, it's going back to the that that whole process of, uh, you know, of maybe over-promising, under-delivering, you know, which can happen. And most people are not bad actors in the car business. Most people really do a great job. I think the government doesn't understand our job. This rule is a horrible rule. The FTC, the fact they have scam in, in the name, there's no protections in this rule that don't already exist. But the problem is it's $50,000 penalty for every violation of the rule. This rule is it's basically can't be implemented properly. Well, can you explain like what, what cannot be implemented? Like why, why do you think, I mean, it's, it's already something that's more or less been done, but why can't this be implemented? We offered a 365-page rebuttal to it. They only gave us 60 days to do that. They would not extend. Usually, they extend for a rule like this. They did not extend, would not. We had a 365-page rebuttal. They took out some of the more onerous parts of it, through, like volunteer protection products. You needed four additional disclosures besides what we already have. And they took that away because it was really, you know, there was no supporting it. But one example would be when someone asks a price for a car, you must give them the final That's price at that time. An example would be you're, you're road testing with a customer. He goes, how much is this car? You got to give them the final price at that point. You may not know the, all the particulars in you know, the trade. What's their credit like? You know, an example. So, it, it, and, and the penalties are so severe. I think just opens up to, to uh, enterprising class action attorneys just to rip us apart. Again, there are no protection in this bill that don't already exist. And we have to keep every communication with us and consumer we have to retain for years, every text, 
every email, every phone conversation. You know, it's really a setup. And, you know, we're fighting in the Fifth Circuit in Texas. Now, the Fifth Circuit does not like overreach of the regulatory state. We don't know how it's going to go. Uh, but, you know, I think we, we're offering a vigorous defense. We have a great litigator who has great success doing the FTC. We don't like to sue people, but we have to because this is defending the car industry. There's no need for this bill, and it's really unimplementable uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, I believe that in life, like when something, there's a reason that this is a focal point for a government agency, right? It could be, you know, constituents are kind of bringing it up as this is, you know, something that's unfair, whatever it may be. If you're being, imagine you weren't a dealer right now and you were the FTC, right? Or you were someone on that side. Where do you think there's truth to this? Or again, I said, why did we get to this point? Like, how could something like this have been avoided or be avoided in the future? Is it a customer experience issue? Is it a branding issue? Well, but look who the FTC is taking on. They're taking on a lot of the big players, you know, Google, you know. Is it a money grab? Is it a money grab? Fair enough. Look, Lena Khan is running the FTC. She's a young person from Yale. I think she's basically following some of her philosophical beliefs about how things operate. But when you're a young person, you may not know all the rules, how life operates, you know, not to excuse anything. It's a realistic view of, of industry, you know. Uh, she's taken on a lot of players and, and lost a lot of times. And hopefully she'll lose again. And I think what's, you know, the problem with government, you know, we need government. We need a good government. You know, there's certain things you do, like, you know, education and uh, the sewers or work and, you know, and, and uh, that type of thing. Public, you know, protecting people. But they also can try to run industry. And we have to have certain protections for industry, you know, industry for overreach and people doing bad things. Those rules already exist, but some people want to re-engineer society in their new view of how they see the world, and that's wrong. You know, I think basically our system is, is the best system in the world. It cre- has the most creativity, uh, but you can't implement. Uh, here's a lot of government officials have never worked in the private business. They've all worked in academia or government. They lack a certain understanding of of the forces that make our success, our society successful, how it works. It's not unrestrained capitalism. We have controlled capitalism, you know, but you can't take a textbook and try to implement that uh, on, on the world. And that's what she's, Lena Khan has done. She's basically trying to implement her view of the world on everybody else. But well, we all have a view too. And there need to be personal protections against overreach. But there's some things, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And this is a very damaging bill. It will add two hours. Independent study shows it will to add two hours to vehicle purchase and $35 billion in cost. If we do anything, we should re- reduce the time it takes to sell a car and reduce the cost to sell a car. But this is not a good thing for the consumer. It's certainly not a good thing for the auto industry. It doesn't fix anything that's 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 broken. It's a fix looking for uh, uh, it's a solution looking for a problem. Mm-hmm. So where are the manufacturers in the picture, right? If I'm Nissan or Toyota or whoever, and I know that my franchisees are going to be potentially have a, you know, a, a prolonged process here for selling a car, I'm pissed off. That sucks for me. It's a reflection of my brand. Where are the manufacturers? They're not directly involved, but they have weighed in. Many of them have weighed in uh, supporting us. And we think we have an excellent case, and you know we're working with uh, we're working with bills in Congress too to defund it as well. It's another way, but you know obviously our supporters are probably in, in the minority in, in Congress in Capitol Hill right now. But uh, you know there's somewhat bipartisan uh, approach to this. To, no solution is to just to defund it so it can't be enforced. Yeah, I mean, I can't help but think, you know, you so you purchased um on in your in your NADA speech, you mentioned that you purchased a Tesla as and you were looking to test out the experience, right? And you went, you physically picked it up. And I think one of the things that you said, which I found very interesting, was that you know, you picked it up at this like 
warehouse that had like plywood on the walls. And but you you said the quiet part out loud, which was what I was thinking when you were experiencing this, which was that you, you weren't, you know, you were observing the experience, but what you had said is that, hey, it just seems as though clearly manufacturers don't respect the retail process or maybe respect's not the right word, but they don't value it, the retail process. And so when I see stuff like this happening, then I wonder, okay, you know, is it in the long-term best interest of manufacturers for the retail experience to deteriorate? I mean, again, I don't want to be too conspiratorial here, but I'm just trying to kind of put all the pieces together, right? We're coming off a couple of years where there have been murmurs of direct-to-consumer and stuff like that. Um, you know, Volkswagen Scout, we we all heard the stuff that Ford had said. So like, what are the real intentions for manufacturers here? We're, what what end game do they want in the next decade? Well, remember, everything's like a pendulum, you know, swings one way and it swings back the other way. That's just how life is. You know, a lot of people forget why things didn't work. They try them again. You know, the, I mean, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing and expecting different results, you know, which is uh, and it's frustrating sometimes. Look, I think there's a lot of common ground between manufacturers and dealers. We basically want the same thing. We want to take care of customers, sell a lot of cars. So why don't we cooperate more? I, and I also see the best results are when there's a collect for both. It's when there's a collaborative relationship between the manufacturer and the dealer. And when there's not, generally the results aren't so good. So maybe that's the reason why they're not so good because they're not collaborative. Now, look, I don't know how to make a car. I, I have no idea. It's very complicated. And selling a car is complicated too. And so we miss, like, I know the manufacturer gets really upset. I've heard they get upset. When someone comes into a meeting, you know, that white safari I ordered, they never got, it, you know, and like one car. I mean, I'm sure they, you know, or Silverado. I'm sure they wanted to make it. There was some good reason why they couldn't. There was some parts supply or some issue. But, you know, get dealer gets pissed off based on a singular car versus they don't understand all the steps it takes to sell a car. I think it's just like it takes 15 minutes. No, it's very complicated because there's a trade, credit issues. I mean, there's a lot of credit issues. And, and direct sales, yes, it seems like, Here's the thing with Tesla. I bought Tesla. Why? There's a big buzz about Tesla. And I've been driving EVs for a while. I need to know everything there is about them because it's it's a it's a happening thing. And people talk big about Tesla. Well, I saw them go buy one. So I ordered one online and it just, you know, everyone says Tesla this, Tesla that. They're so good at this and so good at that. Well, my car came in. They told me on a Tuesday it came in. Take delivery Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'm I'm on Capitol Hill. I'm in committee meetings. The last window is like 5:30, and the place is close to my home. I said I can't come in those three days. They said if you came in those three days, it'll sell it someone else, and they did. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. It's a learning experience. So I ordered another one. I lost my two hundred fifty dollar order fee. So another one came in, and I get notice on a Tuesday. Your car come, has come in. Take delivery Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I said I'm in Europe. I'm at the European auto dealer convention. I say, I can't possibly come in until Monday. You know, I come back that Sunday. I guess you must come between 12 p.m. and 15 p.m. on Monday. Take delivery. 15-minute window. I'm like, whoa. Now, the price went down 3000 between the two. And I didn't order the 20-inch wheel. So I'm about $5,000 ahead. So the consumer always wins. And I take delivery from a warehouse through a loading dock, a warehouse with plywood on the walls. And... I'm like, wow, what dawned on me is that all my deliveries don't look have plywood on the walls. I mean, they're really nice. And if the factory thinks we're cost, they made it that way. Obviously, Tesla thinks putting money into their software, into their charging infrastructure is more important than their retail facilities. So I, I've learned a lot. I like I like the Tesla. And I, you know, it's not everything is good about it, but there are a lot of good things. But you know what? No one can snow me now. The Tesla does this. And Tesla's like, let me tell you, have you brought one? No. Let me tell you my experience. They can't snow me anymore. And the thing is, the manufacturer, everyone's chasing Tesla. Now, Charles Lindbergh was first to fly solo across the Atlantic. Who was second? We don't know. No one knows. You can look it up. Same way, Tesla had a, a window. They did a good job. They, But they're running out of orders. They've lowered their price six times in the past year. And that's causing a real problem because all their owners are now underwater by a lot of money. Your car's worth less, you know, 
by lowering that price, it lowers the price of their trades. So no one can follow that path. That window is closed in, in terms of capitalization. Uh, there's no magic of direct sales. Look at VinFast, look at Fisker. They're going through dealers because the direct order doesn't work when they're not enough orders. And Tesla lower the price because they run out of orders. So, you know, look, it's a competitive market. It's a big market, a lot of room for selling cars different ways and a lot of room for a lot of players. But I, I think we found a lot of things in common with manufacturers under, under my term with NADA. I think we can help solve key issues by working together if we can talk about it, find common ground, you know, and there's a number of initiatives I started, which I'm going to see through that could be beneficial to the industry in that way. And not everybody thinks that way, but again, we should look for things we haven't, look, we got to defend ourselves, dealers against unfair uh, actions from manufacturers, but many of them work well with their dealers and we've got to encourage that kind of relationship, I think. What do you think Tesla does well? What do you think what do you think about their sales process? Is there anything that you believe is superior to the dealership model? Well, they don't have this way, they don't have many models and there's very few options. Uh, I was kind of surprised. The only free color was white. So I'm driving a white Tesla is cheap. Red costs two thousand. So everything's a la carte. You know, you gotta get the steps. And I bought all the steps that I needed to really experience them. Simplicity. Well, look, no other manufacturer has just a couple of models with a couple features that you can buy. You know, I think they found a way to produce cars efficiently and high volume. I thought one thing that's really interesting is uh, the little details. Someone thought of the little details in manufacturing. One is, you know, the, uh, the sun visor, you know, it's kind of hard to keep it connected on that clip, you know, always falls. They have a magnet there. Someone thought, let's have a magnet. So you get the vibe and you're, and you're supposed to go, it clips right in. Let me follow that. And there's a warning tag on the bottom of the visor that talks about your airbag. They put theirs on the top of the visor. And <laughs> someone thought about that. So they're thinking about things. And. You know, it's kind of interesting. But I've, I have an ID4 own now. I own a couple of those, Ionic 5. And I'm comparing, you know, apples with apples, what's good and what's not. I mean, there's some things, no lights in it. There's, there are other, uh, it's complex. You got to, you got to run the wipers. It's a horrible system, you know. And what's really good is the downloads. So I've had a lot of updates, maybe one a month, OTA. So, so you still have your Tesla? Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. I like, I like their over there updates. I, I think mm -hmm. I'm going to write an article on this. You know, a lot of people get tired of their car. And so once they buy the, when the car comes out of the factory door, that's the car you're going to get. With over there mm -hmm. updates, you can update and change the functionality of a car over time. Mm -hmm. I think that might cause people to like their car longer. You know, it might change the buying cycle, you know, because if your styling mm -hmm. looks pretty good and you pretty like the car, if you're getting, uh, improvements through OTAs. That's in performance, how things operate, uh, ad buying additional features. That's mm -hmm. significant. It could change the buying. You know, cars last longer. It could change the buying habits of consumers. Mm -hmm. So I now the VW has OTAs that really work as well. You know, what's funny is uh, Honda's coming out with. Uh, a EV, and I asked the head of service for, for Honda, will it do OTAs? And he couldn't, didn't even know. So, I mean, <laughs> oh, I think I'm ahead of some people. That's not good. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't even sure. And I, I see that being over the updates important now, there's two aspects of that. One is that dealers should participate in over the year subscription and accessory sales to manufacturers. See, they're looking, they need to find new profit centers, the manufacturers to sell people things, uh, that they can do that with over the updates, uh, that you can buy performance enhancements or other features. And I think dealers should participate in the revenue stream of those things, because if those things don't work or break, they'll come to the dealer and we'll just say, call the 800 number. I can't help you. So I think that's an opportunity for dealers and also opportunity for manufacturers. They should have us participate in those revenue streams.
T today we're hovering around like 7% market penetration for electric vehicles. A year ago, that was at about 5.9%. What do you think, what do you think this looks like in about 10 years? Where are we headed? Well, the government's about to announce NHTSA and EPA new mandates. I think I've heard March 22nd, which would lead to 68% of retail sales being required to be EVs by 2032. That's less than 10 years. It's not achievable for every manufacturer to get to that level. Look, I, I like EVs. There's a market for EVs. If dealers don't have desirable, affordable EVs, we'll lose that business to the direct sellers. So there is a market, more in some markets than others, California, the coast, and the heartland. Uh, but the question is, what is the level of consumer acceptance going to be? And look, you said EV sales are about 7%, and they were about 7% retail sales last year. But Tesla is 60% or so of that 7%. So OEM is only about two to three percent of their EV sales for e, uh, of sales for EVs, and we have over a hundred day supply of cars. So what's that telling us? It's telling us consumer demand is tepid, and for a lot of good reasons. And uh, even Tesla's they lower the price six times and run out of customers, and uh, they have like two week, weeks worth of orders, you know, and they're not expanding because they if they do they're going to be they'll have to cut production. So I, I think, what are the barriers to EVs? Affordability is one. And S&P International said that the, the same model EV costs 40% more than a gas version. Okay, you can't go by averages, okay? The, the barrier is affordability with higher interest rates, you know, 60% live paycheck to paycheck. You know, a couple hundred dollars a month makes a difference. They can't afford it. So it's a charging challenge. Now they say, oh, home charging, you have home charging. Well, you gotta buy a charger and half the homes don't have electrical service without additional upgrade. They don't have the amperage. So that's additional cost. And half people don't own a home, live in a street, live in an apartment, rent a home, or have street parking. They'll have to use the DC fast charging network, which costs more, it's inconvenient, and often sometimes broken. So look, if the car charged in five minutes, I like it gas your car in five minutes at a 350 mile range and costs the same, sure, go for it. But it doesn't. It costs more. It, you got to spend money on charging. It's inconvenient. It's a hassle, and and you have range anxiety because you wonder where am I going to go if I'm not outside my home? Where am I going to get my charge? Will the charger be working? You know, I there's one major brand which comes free with the car. I have one of the cars I have, and I like trying different chargers. One was 35, give me 35 kilowatts an hour. One's giving me 56. One was giving me 125. The same brand, about the same level of charge on my car. So there's other factors involved with this. Now I could be two and two and a half hours there. If, you know, get a charge, that's not going to work. So it's, the government is going to force this. But the, here's the problem is the it's all about carbon footprint, right? They say zero emission. Well, nothing's zero emission. You know, it's, the electricity comes from someplace. The problem is you've got to mine, you've got to move 500,000 pounds of mineral to make one battery. You got to extract 100,000 pounds of ore, process that ore. It's very carbon intensive. The carbon footprint's bigger on an EV than a gas car, significantly at the factory door. Volvo did a study, set, it's 70,000 miles for its even. And with batteries getting larger, it's probably 100,000 miles. You increase carbon emissions with EVs. You won't reduce it. I mean, that's, I mean, and China's making the batteries with coal power plants, you know, so it's, it's, it's not, it's not environmentally, I hate to tell people, it's not environmentally going to help us move in the right direction. And I'm not opposed. I like, I, you know, there's a role for them. We need them. I like them in my daily ride as an EV. It fits my lifestyle. It's great. Enjoy it. I'm learning from it, but it's not for everybody. And here's what's going to hurt, I think, in the heartland where people live a little further apart and they're reliant more on big trucks, you know, F-150s, Silverado, you know, that those, those trucks, the batteries are huge. The cost of the vehicle is very high and utility towing something is very limited. And in, in the cold weather, it's even worse. So how... It's going to take. It's going to just kill the manufacturers dependent upon heavy trucks. The F one hundred and fifty Lightning is complete failure. 
And these other guys are going to fail too for the same reasons. You really need a more gentle slope in terms of adoption. You need a charging network. You need affordability. But it's being rammed down people's throats with the government regulations. And a lot of the headlines are lulling people to sleep. Oh, they're moderating. Oh, they're adjusting. No, they're not. They, it, you know, they give me lip service and it, it's going to be onerous, these regulations. Your statement on the, on the F-150 Lightning being a complete failure, why do you think that is? Well, I did say it. It costs. It costs a lot. And the utility, you know, you don't have the range of your towing. And those are big barriers. I mean, you, you mean, if you, and here's the thing is, okay, so you use your F-150 Lightning. It's probably a good product, you know. Uh, doesn't mean people want to buy it, you know. Mm-hmm. In itself, it's probably well-made in that way. So let's say you're towing a, a boat, okay, and you need a charge. You can't just drive up the charging station with your boat. You block all the stations. So you got to take your boat, unhook it, put it's it It's not practical. Drive up, charge for an hour and a half, and go back, hook your boat up, then you'll you know, 130 miles. You know, hopefully your lake's near your house. But it's just not the practicality. Plus, it costs $20,000 more. And that's a lot to people. So speaking of China, you know, murmurs about China entering the U.S. with their EVs, you know, they're, they're, they've been you know, spreading pretty far and wide across the world, you know, outside of the U.S. What are your thoughts there? I was in China in November. It was really an interesting trip. And I spoke at the China Auto Dealer Association Convention. You know, Beijing is as modern as any city in the world. You know, it, I'm so glad I went. And it, I just had met some wonderful people, had a great experience. Now, if you look at the manufacturers, you can't look at them in isolation in the United States. The manu- most of the manufacturers deal with in, in Asia. They deal with Europe and the United States. And what's happening in, in China, the Chinese could not compete with ICE, turbine combustion engines, because basically the manufacturers locked up the supply chain. Uh, but they, 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 what they figured out 10 years ago, we're going to go move in the EV direction. Okay, Part of that may be to reduce their consumption of oil because they don't have the domestic supply. They want to reduce the de- you know, demand on oil. So they locked up the supply chain, 80% of supply chain of critical minerals to make batteries and to process those minerals. And in China, uh, they're working to, ex- you know, they, the Europeans, the Japanese, Koreans, and the Americans, I mean, Tesla and, and General Motors have been very active in China selling cars. Today, the Chinese government is trying to push them out of China. Uh, promoting new energy vehicles, electric vehicles, plug-ins, and to buy domestic homegrown grown cars. GM, the past 10 years, sold more cars in China than the United States. And it was automotive news. I was amazed. An article a few months ago, they said in five years, GM only be in China. So the Chinese are going to push the other company. You've taught us how to build cars. Thank you very much. We'll take it from here. So they're losing market share a lot because of EVs. The Chinese have a 35% cost advantage at a minimum over any other EV manufacturer because it controls supply of minerals, uh, the processes of minerals, and they have the involvement of their government, which is kind of hard to un- un- unravel from that. 35% cost advantage. Now, Elon, Tesla, Elon Musk said, unrestrained, the Chinese would cause uh, an extinction event among manufacturers around the world. You know, and there are some barriers to them. So you look at Europe, they're going to ban the sale of gasoline cars in 2035. That's their plan. And then you have in the United States, new new plans being announced going 68% or so EV by 2032. So the manufacturers have to move in that EV direction. But the Chinese, with this cost advantage, uh, could undercut everybody else. And they're, they're heading for Europe. There's only 9% tariff. They're going to take huge market share. And... And, and they're likely coming to North America. And, you know, we've had waves here before. We've had waves of Japanese brands, European brands, Korean brands. A Chinese wave could be quite different. That could, because of their price advantage, it could take out some manufacturers along with their dealers. It's very possible. Very, very interesting. I never heard that the embedded cost advantage is just not something I considered, especially with your point, right? They have the government connections there where they've really taken over. Um, a lot of you know areas around the world where they do mining. So that's very a good point. As you think about that, right, and you think about the future of 
the car business in general, and of course your group, but I'm, I'm thinking broadly, what brands are you bullish on nowadays? Automotive brands. Well, that's, that's like saying, which your children do you like best? You know, clearly uh, some brands are su- superior to others because their product is better and because their relationship with dealers, but dealers generally know who those are. There's, it's a, Big market. I think cars aren't going away. I think personal mobility is really important. Affordable personal mobility is really a source of, of freedom that people can live where they want to live, work where they want to work, take their family where they want to go. I think dealers play a big role in preserving affordable personal transportation. So they keep talking about EVs. Uh, it's like a, a horse and buggy. No, it's still the horse and buggy. You just change the horse's food. You know, electricity versus gas, of course, it's still there, you know, so it's it's not such a big change. We had electric cars a century ago. So uh, I think the future is still good for automobiles. People clamor for automobiles. Kids still want automobiles. They may be driving a little later uh, than they were before. But as as they move to the suburbs or have families, they need cars. So I think there's still a role for the car dealer. I'm, I'm bullish on the future. We've had challenges before threats before dealers are really creative look how fast we mutated during covid to adjust to the new reality really fast really quick really imaginative and creative some of the most creative people are, are car dealers and car, they work in car dealerships so uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future but there are some really large challenges you know like the ftc like the epa coming you know that, that you mentioned Scout, and you have the unanswered question how, of distribution from VW Scout and Honda Sony, the Afila. You know, basically, dealers have protections. You know, in a lot of states, and and if they try to sell direct, it would be contrary to those regulations, and the state associations are going to challenge them legally. We would like to see them work through dealers, but they've not announced it. And my response to them was silence speaks. You know, until we hear something. We're probably going to think the worst, but we're working now on how to respond to these new EPA NHTSA regulations, which are very onerous. They could they could bankrupt some car manufacturers potentially. Manufacturer goes out. I mean, the dealers could go out too, because the cost of transition is very high to electrification. Uh, some manufacturers, you know, if California has their own fourteen states or so follow California emissions in a year and a half, you're supposed to be thirty five percent EV. Every manufacturer, thirty-five percent. Again, we're three to four percent as an industry. That won't be achieved. California likely will move the goalposts like they have in the past. But these federal regulations are owners. Now, a couple of things to look at. If if Biden remains as president, these rules will stay in effect. If we have a Republican administration, if that were to happen, uh, regulations sometimes take years to unwind. So a lot of the regulations will be announced maybe later this month. Are going to be there for quite a while, and it's uh, it's going to be quite something to see how you can match availability of product with consumer demand. Consumer demand is tepid, and EVs above a certain point. And I think there's going to be some kind of collision here. Something's going to break. Absolutely. And when you say something is going to break, what do you mean by that? Just prices declining, or something else? Well, the manufacturers. Because you know, here's the thing about EVs, it, it costs a lot to manufacture, okay? Uh, and they keep talking about battery prices going down. Right now, there's a lull in, in commodity prices like lithium, cobalt. Those prices are going to go skyrocket as demand increases. We've got increased mining 400 to 4,000% in like a few years. It's not going to happen. It can't happen. So the Battery prices likely the manufacturer will go up. Do you, with, can manufacturers make money on them? They're not now, probably not. Uh, and unless they get to a certain uh, volume, and so if manufacturers have overcapacity of EVs and, and dealers aren't willing to take them, what's going to happen then? Now the fine is like twenty five thousand dollars a car. They can't make the the, the emission standards. Here, an example would be. The California emissions are require 35% of cars to be EV in a year and a half. Let's just say those rules take effect and Infinity has no EVs. They just have to stop selling gasoline cars in those states. That's where it breaks. Okay. 10 years from today, 
Do we have more dealers or fewer dealers? I would say the question is there'll be fewer dealers. There may not be fewer dealerships, but there's more consolidation. There'll be fewer dealers. There's about roughly 8,000 dealers, 16,000 dealerships, something like that. Uh, there'll be fewer dealers just because the cost of entry is so large and economies of scale to be larger is, uh, is, is something that's been going on for a long time. In fact, uh, there's been fewer dealers since back like 1920s. It's been a long-term trend, but there's more consolidation. So there will be fewer dealers, but not necessarily fewer dealerships. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, was, I was actually alluding towards fewer dealerships. Well, remember, the population is probably growing, uh, or at least stable or not shrinking like a lot of countries. Most uh, industrial countries are shrinking population without immigration. We probably have the health, healthiest demographics. And there's a move to the suburbs from the city uh, post-COVID and for a lot of reasons. And I think uh, demand for cars will, will stay strong and, and as such. Uh, there'll be some... Con- well, here's, here's a point I'll just say. Well, the manufacturers have not been supportive of the dealer position in trying to s- tell government that this is moving too far too fast with EVs. It may be because of competitive reasons for them. I think just on myself, I think they could have four positions, the manufacturers. One is if we fail, the government will bail us out. Two is uh, if we say go bankrupt or reorganize, clear out the dealers we don't need and, and move forward. Three, Republican administration will bail us out. Or four, we have value. We're a small company, have value, but we'll be merged into some other organization. They may take one of those four positions and it's not necessarily the right positions. I think the manufacturers should take a stronger position with the manu- with the government in terms of these what the requirements are, they, the, the, the cost is not there. They cost too much and the technology is completely available uh, to accomplish what they want. But unfortunately, the manufacturers have decided, other than Toyota, not to take an aggressive position and just go along to get along. And they're the ones that are going to suffer some consequences through this, I believe, in this transition. So otherwise, dealers are... Yeah. We'll mutate. We'll adjust. We're like bamboo. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We have in the past some I'm bamboo. I'm, I like that. <laughs> I'm bullish, bullish on the future, and uh, we'll be fine. We'll get through it. Jeff Ohanka, thanks so much for coming on. This is seriously awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating. Consider subscribing to the show, and check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.